1996, Binti, a female gorilla at the Brookfield Zoo, displayed a behavior that at the time completely contradicted the traditional views of evolutionary biology. A small three-year-old child had fallen into her enclosure, and as soon as he did, Binti quickly ran over, picked him up, and protected him from other gorillas, until eventually moving him to the entrance gate, where the zookeepers could then retrieve the unconscious boy. Binti's action that day sparked questions about how morality is viewed. Traditionally, evolutionary biology views behaviors through the lens of survival of the fittest, or genetic self-interest. But Binti's behavior challenged this perspective, demonstrating that even animals we are distantly related to can exhibit immense compassion for those that are not even part of the same species. Up until this point, a lot of the videos I've talked about in this series have been rather dark in nature, but that's because I wanted to get the full breadth of the problem across before I try to tackle it realistically. So consider this video a hypothesis, a starting point I came up with that hasn't been tested and as a result should be heavily scrutinized. But my hope is that it can at least provide a thought-provoking idea, if nothing else. Morality is an interesting trait. Whether behaviorally ingrained, or the byproduct of some other adaptive function, it's clear that it holds the key to this conundrum. But the evolution of morality itself is also in a bit of a predicament. Cooperation, contrary to what you may believe, is still a competitive process, and cannot evolve unless it offers advantages to those who choose to work together. Specifically, it evolves only if individuals who are prone to working together outcompete individuals who are not. But in this process, with cooperation succeeding and becoming the predominant outcome, a new trait has emerged to maintain unity, morality. Morality evolved as a solution to the cooperation problem, essentially with the goal of allowing otherwise quote-unquote selfish beings to reap the benefits of group living, but with an important distinction. Biologically speaking, we're designed for cooperation with some people, not everybody. Why is this the case? It's because universal cooperation is inconsistent with the principles of evolution. Cooperation evolved as a survival advantage first and was nice as a secondary bonus. And as a logical extension, the argument can be made that morality evolved not just to benefit ourselves, but to benefit our group over other groups. Now I know this sounds strange. Suggesting that morality evolved for competition is definitely counterintuitive. I mean, a lot of what we consider moral doesn't seem like group conflict on the face of it. And on top of that, it makes morality seem amoral in some sense. But morality is nature's way of making individuals work together, even when they have different interests. The problem that arises, though, is that instead of there being conflict between individuals, this morality has led to there being conflict between groups. So I guess you can see where I'm going with this. Basically, the same morality that has found a way to overcome individual interests and align small groups needs to be applied at one level up. We need to find a way to create a meta-morality or a meta-belief, so to speak, that applies to everyone one that enables groups with conflicting viewpoints to live together and prosper, regardless of what they look like or think. I don't think this idea is anything new, but the way we go about it is something I'm not really sure how to do, and that's primarily because of the first video I made in this series. Both false ideas and real ideas can be beneficial, but the conclusion I came to in that video suggested what we should implement should not be seen so much as what works now, but what works continuously for everyone throughout time and I would define this as what is best. But there's a problem with this. For starters, speaking strictly from a philosophical standpoint, I think we all want what is best. The problem is nobody knows what is best, myself included. So we have to find a way to figure this out. Joshua Green suggests what is best has to be defined as a shared value rather than an independent authority. And I'm prone to agree. Instead of relying on external leaders, what is best has to be based on connecting experiences or shared values, which loyalty gets in the way of. In my third video in this series, I talked about how loyalty is at the root of a lot of polarization online. But in small groups, loyalty is a good thing. When facing moral dilemmas where individual interests don't align with collective interests, emotions like empathy and loyalty are effective at restraining selfish behavior for the greater good of the community. But when confronted with complex moral problems, pitting one group against another, relying on these same emotions that work for resolving conflict within groups is exactly what drives polarization. And so in these situations, we need the ability to step back and employ critical thinking to find some type of common ground. Definitely easier said than done. But what if finding common ground could be that shared value Joshua Green is talking about? Just finding something two people can agree on. Obviously, there's still a risk in this approach, as it could cause us to try and reinforce our own views rather than seek common ground. 
but this can be overcome through the illusion of explanatory depth. People often overestimate their understanding of complex topics. For example, if I were to ask you how zippers work, you would probably say you know, but then struggle to provide an accurate explanation. What happens is when people are challenged to explain in detail, they recognize their limited understanding and become more moderate in their opinions. Research by Philip Fernbach and colleagues found that by prompting individuals to explain the mechanics of certain policies, they become more moderate in their views. Simply asking for reasons behind opinions does little to change deep beliefs. But asking people to explain why or how their beliefs can work does. I could see something like this working in areas of public discourse. Instead of asking others for their opinions, we should encourage individuals to explain how policies are supposed to work. Maybe by finding common ground first, and engaging in discussions where people traditionally consider rivals can then honestly try to listen to each other. Still, the big flaw I see in this is that it takes a lot of individual work and responsibility to approach public discourse with a clear head. And if we don't have an incentive to do so, I honestly just don't think we would do it. Which is why this last point is something I struggled with for a while. The incentives bit that was the conclusion of my last video. But after thinking about it, I can see curiosity working as an informal bridge. Incentives don't just take shape in the form of traditional rewards like money or popularity. The dopaminergic system is a facet of our biology that capitalizes on incentives to make us do things. Curiosity is one of those feelings. When we encounter a novel idea, the brain releases dopamine, a neurotransmitter associated with the anticipation of a reward, meaning the brain has already effectively created an incentive structure for curiosity. It's a long shot, but I could see this minimizing the effects of polarization. If we try and approach things with a curious mind, posing questions and getting people we disagree with to think about the outcomes of what they believe, while simultaneously embodying these principles ourselves, a fruitful discussion is a likely outcome. One that, while maybe not entirely eliminating conflict, can at least get us to realize we're all on the same side. In all likelihood, I don't think 100% unification of everyone at all times to the point where we never have conflict is a probable outcome. But I don't think this is something we need to escape group biases. Cooperation is an interesting phenomenon because it doesn't mean everybody has to get along all the time or agree on everything. It just means two people have to agree on a few things that can anchor them. For example, if two people walk past each other on the street, just by not harming each other, they are choosing to cooperate. If two people engage in a discussion, just by listening to each other, they are choosing to cooperate. And I think living through the principles of finding common ground first and being curious second can be this bridge. There's still a lot of work and things that I haven't been able to figure out, but I think this is a good starting point for a really complex problem. And at the end of the day, if we want to change the outside world, we have to start by changing ourselves. With that said, I'd be really curious to see what you guys think on this subject. If you're interested, a great book I read in preparation for this series is Moral Tribes, Emotion, Reason, and the Bridge Between Us and Them by Joshua Green. It's a book that I honestly can't recommend enough. Until next time, cheers.